everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at kind of a favourite book of mine. I, I've reread this a couple of times throughout my life and it always makes me chuckle because it's a comedy novel and that's all you can really hope for. Now, this novel is called Love and Other Near-Death Experiences by Mill Millington. Uh, I think I first read this when I was like a teenager looking at different universities. Like I took this around with me on some university tours. I do remember that because it is a large size of book and very awkward to carry around. But it is very funny, so I thought I'd share it with you. Is it related to witches? Well, there's a witch in it, uh, by which I mean there is a character who is Wiccan. So, on that tenuous link, I'm going to tell you all about a book that I really like. Sue me. Uh, so I'm going to read you the blurb, which is quite long. Rob Garland is getting married in two months. Oddly, however, this is the least of his problems. More vexing than the seating arrangements, the choice of wedding stationery, more even than the savagely obscene expense of everything, is the fact that Rob should be dead, and he knows it. He should have been sitting in a pub at the very moment it was wiped from the earth, but he wasn't, thanks only to a series of pointless coincidences. Now he's paralysed by the knowledge that every decision he makes, no matter how tiny, has potentially enormous and even fatal consequences. Faced with an ultimatum from his girlfriend to either sort himself out, which means taking less than two hours to choose a pair of underpants, or call the wedding off, he sets about trying to come to terms with the fact that he's inexplicably still breathing. After pouring his heart out to the listeners of his late night jazz radio show, he soon finds himself encountering others who really ought not to be alive either. And that's when things become yet more worrying, because it turns out that their search to understand why they've each remained oddly alive might very well end up killing them all. Life, death, defining moments, existential angst, and whether or not you should take sugar in your coffee, love and other near-death experiences is a jackknifing comedy about those things which are no laughing matter. That's a fucking long-ass blurb. But basically, Rob Garland, he has this uh, near-death experience, he's returning some towels to a shop, which means that he misses being murdered by a, a truck jackknifing into a pub. And he starts to have these moments where he's like, what if I put one foot out of the bath before the other foot? What if that's the thing that condemns me to death next? And he can't deal with it. So he goes on this quest, essentially, and he meets a couple of other people who have also been in these situations, and we read their stories about how they've narrowly escaped the clutches of death. And they're all trying to find meaning. And it's a book basically about accepting your own mortality, survivor's guilt, a lot of these big, hefty topics, but it also manages to be fucking hilarious. It's got a lot of very keenly observed humour. I think his original novel, um, Things My Girlfriend and I Have Argued About, was based on like a blog. And to a certain extent, this novel does feel a bit like a blog. Like there's bits. So there's like a two page section on wedding stationery and what's the deal with wedding stationery and like another two page section on like oh trying to find a parking space in london which adds to like the comedy there's comedy in there but also a lot of the exchanges with people are funny as well like i think the book really shines when it gets into like dialogue uh, and the interplay of the different characters which takes a little while because for like the first third of the novel rob is just on his own having his little crisis and then he starts to meet other people and the people he meets are Zach who is an American soldier who should have died with the rest of his like platoon squadron but he should have died with them and didn't uh, and uh, a woman who went out for cigarettes and her hotel burned down and the Wiccan lady who should have been on a plane which went down but she didn't because I think she'd misplaced her passport or something I can't remember her story that well he starts meeting all these people and then they find out that there's a cult of like right-wing Christian extremists who are trying to kill them because they belong dead like they have survived when God tried to kill them and that makes them you know an affront to nature and around all of that there's just delightful comedy and also a weirdly sweet romance which probably shouldn't be as sweet as it is but it remains one of my favorite love stories so there you go um and i'm just going to read you a little bit from it which i find quite funny so this is the beginning of chapter five and rob has returned home after having a sort of minor epiphany this is just after he's you know explained everything that's happened to him um, on his radio show, and he's, he's feeling pretty good about himself. I did 
didn't know whether to tell Joe everything as soon as I got back to the house. I mean, I thought it was pretty newsworthy being psychologically reborn and having escaped from a berserk assailant all in one night. But against this, one had to weigh the fact that Joe could be, well, irritable if you woke her up early. She could be really quite strikingly irritable. And it's a bit crap to evade a psychotic attacker and need to go home and get killed by your girlfriend. Aware of this, I crept into the bedroom and tried to decide whether I should rouse Joe or not. I moved around the bed, looking down at her lying there in deep mouth open slumber, a soft motor of steady snoring ticking over at the back of her throat. I was still considering my options carefully when I tripped over some shoes and fell into the wardrobe. Fuck! Thud! Fuck! Mm. Joe stirred. She raised herself up on one elbow and did a sloppy approximation of peering around the room. Her eyes remained closed and her head didn't so much rotate as fall from one position to another as though her neck had been deboned. She looked a little like a newly born mouse sightlessly sniffing the air. Oh, I said, upbeat with surprise. You're awake then? What? I was there. She was groping for her brain's on switch. What time is it? I'm not sure. But anyway, if you're still up, I've got something to tell you. I took a big, deliberately audible breath by way of a drum roll. It's OK, Joe. It's all going to be OK. I've taken hold of things and turned them around. You said I needed to change and I have done. I changed tonight. I thought about what you said and how much I wanted to make things right for us. I attacked the situation head on and I beat it faced it down everything is okay now jesus fucking christ it's quarter to four and i was attacked in the street it's still the middle of the bastard night i love you what the fucking hell are you talking about at quarter to four in the fucking morning out of bullets rob retreat i think i'll go downstairs and put the kettle on i fled to the kitchen while joe was still scaling the ragged horror of being woken up in the vicinity of 4 a.m when her mind had finally climbed over this frustrating mountain, I didn't want it to immediately find me standing on the other side. While I hid out, I made myself an Irish coffee. It was a Rob's Irish coffee. Get half a mug of whiskey, a spoonful of instant, top up with hot water, and add cream if you have it. If not, milk. And to be honest, you can pretty much do without the milk too. I was in the dining room, hunched over my mug like someone inhaling a cold cure, when Joe shuffled in. She was wearing her lilac next pyjamas with the kitten on the front, and her hair appeared to be in some distress. She rounded the table and flopped heavily into the chair opposite me, then pulled my coffee away to in front of her and blew on it. So, she took a sip, thought hard for a moment, then repeated. So? So, I've sorted myself out, I replied. Her hand moved up to intercept a clump of hair that had fallen over her face. She caught it and imprisoned it behind her ear. She stared at me and nodded, wordlessly. I have, Joe, I said. How? Tell me what happened. Oh, and please go slowly, keeping in mind that I'm still legally asleep. It reminds me a lot of like things like Douglas Adams. It's that kind of slightly surreal stuff, which is still kind of partially grounded in reality by the fact that, you know, there's one normal character there. It's very much that. Uh, and I really love uh, all the interactions between him and, like, the other characters that he meets along his quest. And as the situations get, like, more bizarre and more kind of tangled up in this incredibly strange scenario they found themselves in, it just gets funnier and funnier because they continue to react to it like kind of normal, real people would with, like, barely restrained horror and also sarcasm and disbelief and it, it just hits like all the things that I really love about a humour book and having this kind of new agey uh, kind of philosophical question aspect to it is also right up my street and then along comes the Wiccan character and she is just an amazing comedic cliche of a Wiccan She's very into, like, moons and stars, and she says just a lot of things that could be ripped straight from a poster in Glastonbury. She's just hilarious to behold in any scene, especially when you, like, pit her against an American military guy and a woman who is, like, 90% sarcasm and cigarettes. She's very cynical um, and not, you know, t not, not a sufferer of fools. And watching the interplay between those characters just 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 makes me laugh every time. Because on the one hand, you've got this very 
oh, I'm very spiritual, I'm very awake to the light of the universe, but also incredibly judgmental and passive-aggressive. And then on the other side, you've got someone who's openly aggressive uh, and very cynical and very quick to snap up on any hint of weakness or foolishness and just swoop down on it and make them eat it. it it's a very interesting cast of characters and they work really well together. So although this book doesn't have a huge amount to do with the witches, it still remains one of my favourites and one I had to recently repurchase and read because I have this habit of just reading a book and then going, well, don't need that anymore. So, so I've gone through quite a few copies of my favourites over the years because I'm just like, oh, I can't be bothered to store this on a shelf. Bye. And then I have to buy it again to read it again. I should really just start buying things as ebooks. But uh, I, I just like a real book. You can throw a real book at someone when they're being annoying. And if you do that with an e-reader, you just have to buy another one. That's why I'm on my third Kindle. It, it's really quite shaming to me that every time I go and like buy an e-book, it's like, do you want to deliver this to Sarah's third Kindle? Which is what it's named itself for some reason. Reminding me that I have killed two Kindles previous to this. I have that electronic blood on my hands. I've lost the point of what I was saying. Anywho, I've read other books by Bill Millington, and they are as funny. Uh, there's things my girlfriend and I have argued about, which has a really weird plot, uh, and I'm not too keen on. But there's another one called Instructions for Living Someone Else's Life, uh, and it's basically this guy who, like, it's been a while since I read it, but he essentially kind of goes to sleep as a fucked up mid-twenty-something, and he wakes up and he's, like, fifty and married. Uh, with this weird job and a wife who he doesn't, I don't think, even know in his, like, present life. And he thinks that he has time travelled, whereas I think the explanation for it is that he's had two separate head injuries. And so the second one kind of wiped out everything that had happened since the first one. So it's kind of got this, like, weird kind of sci-fi feel, but then also it's very grounded in reality. And it's just him trying to get used to being, like, suddenly a lot older that he was before in this like much more mature relationship which is kind of falling down and not very successful at the point that he wakes up uh, and remembers it and it's, it's just very strange but very lovely but this one remains my favorite and it's just quite unexpected and strange and very witty in all the right places and if you're looking for like a fun distracting read I can really recommend this, although I do have to trigger warn for some things because a lot, of, obviously, a lot of the subject matter is to do with like death, survivor's guilt, depression, uh, and and all of this stuff. So I'm, I'm going to trigger warn uh, for mentions of suicide and uh, graphic suicide attempt. Um, a lot of I'm going to say semi inappropriate comedy. It, it comes across as sexist in places. But I would argue that because Rob is himself kind of a pathetic character, um, it's meant to be kind of humorous and self-deprecating as much as it is, you know, sexist. Like, he's kind of waxing lyrical about people's bums at certain points. So, so there's that. And also talk about, like, drug use and alcoholism uh, and some stuff that is kind of, I guess, similar to, like, terrorism. So th there's that in there. Um, but I think... It's handled in such an interesting way because it takes these really serious things that are happening. And on one level, you're like, I feel really bad for these characters. I completely understand where they're coming from. And I just want to, like, pat them on the head and tell them that everything's okay. But at the same time, it's still funny. And I find it really odd that it can be funny about those things without coming across as, like, disrespectful, at least to me. Um, so, so that's quite interesting as well. But I definitely think you should go and get yourself a copy. The ebook is out there. It's probably quite cheap. But you can also buy the paperback secondhand because this book came out a while ago. Um, it came out in, I think, 2006, according to the front, which is a long time ago, and now I feel old. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, get a hold of a copy. Let me know if you've read it. I'm sorry that there isn't a huge amount of, of witchy content, but having just recently reread it, I just had to talk about it. And only one other person I know has read this novel, and they're probably sick of hearing about it. So go read it. Tell me your thoughts. Uh, if you have any other books you'd like to recommend, do so down below in the comment section on YouTube. Get in touch via Twitter or Instagram. Sometimes I check the email account, but only if I'm feeling a bit weird. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'll see you in the next one.
Bye.